Um, thanks so much for having me. It's super, I know it's like, we're not actually in a room together, but it does make a difference to see all of your faces. I just want to switch my view back so I can see all of you guys. Hey, <laughs> thanks so much for having me. Um, I have yet to join my own woodworking guild because I can't seem to stay in one place for very long, but I'm excited to when the time finally comes. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I'm just basically here to show you a little bit about my work, just to give you like context and sort of where I'm coming from. Um, if you see anything in there that you want to ask me questions about, sort of peppered throughout, please feel free. Um, and then we're going to jump into the 5-7 rule, which I'm sure you've already read about. Many of you may already know about. Um, but it really is one of those things that I just haven't seen written about anywhere. Um, but ever since I learned it at North Bennett Street School, sort of in the context of cabrio leg shaping, it's just, it's shown up in everything that I've made, everything from Windsor chairs to those whimsical smalls that you were referencing. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to sort of go over it. Um, I'm actually in the process of writing an article for Fine Woodworking about it. So there will be something about this recorded out there. But in the meantime, as far as I know, I haven't been able to find anything. So um, does any, anybody already know it? Has anyone practiced it in the past? No? Well, I'm seeing a few shaking heads. All right, cool. Well, let's start with um, just a super quick, like jump into my work, if that's cool. Um, just to give y'all context. All right, so I'm gonna share screen. Um, if you've already been to my website, forgive me for re repeating myself. Um, let's see. You would think that I, I would have nailed um, Zoom by now or whatever. There we go. So are you seeing white with a little heart in the middle? Yes. All right, great. Okay, cool. So there's me being a dweeb in North Carolina. <laughs> so Basically, I'm a furniture maker primarily, and I specialize in period furniture, um, sort of specifically carving, turning, and Windsor chair making. Um, but I did not start out in woodworking. That's actually all fairly recent. Um, I have, however, always had this really stubborn desire to make everything myself, which I think is, is something that a lot of us can probably relate to. Um, and I guess when I say stubborn, I mean really, really stubborn. Like for example, when I decided I wanted to learn to weave, I started by buying a sheep. Um, this is my sheep on the left, uh, Liesl, the one in the front photo bombed. I do not know who that is. <laughs> but that same sort of stubbornness and interest in understanding processes from scratch um, has really manifested in my woodworking practice. Um, so this is an example of a Windsor settee that I built a few years ago. Um, and it's a great example of doing things obsessively from scratch. You know, most of the parts are split out of an oak log and my very good friend and super talented friend, Peter Galbert, um, and I designed it and then sort of just crushed it over the course of a month using hand tools and, you know, basically no machines. So while I still sort of make a lot of these Windsor style or Greenwood chairs, I also make kind of a range of objects. Um, again, some of which are largely traditional and some of which really play with the limits of functionality. Um, so I was trained at North Bennett Street School, and this is one of those classic views of my bench, you know. Um, and it's, for those of you who know about it, you know, it's really just all about old school, both aesthetically and in terms of processes. And so when I was there, I really learned to love hand tool woodworking, but also, and sort of while I was learning to reproduce old school furniture um, and redesign old pieces, I started really thinking about social context and asking myself sort of, can the beauty of these objects be disassociated from sort of the problematic social dynamics of the era in which they were popularized? Um, and my answer is kind of no. And so instead of just reproducing, I started to use these sort of iconic markers of American craft like ornate carving and inlaid images and glass enameling to talk about like social inequity um, and gender. Uh, so my furniture kind of speaks to female experience specifically, sort of by drawing on all of these ways that furniture fulfills these like really stereotypical female gender roles by like welcoming and hosting and bearing weight. And it's like, it's, you know, it's domestic, um, it's beautiful and it's labor is sort of invisible. 
And this particular piece is one of my most recent large works. Um, and it's a, sort of a reimagining of a classic Aerobac seti um, with imagery in that sort of iconic gold on black Hitchcock furniture painting style, which I'm sure you all recognize um, from thrift stores or your parents' kitchens or, um, but in this version, I sort of blend contemporary designs into the traditional fruit and garden motifs that you recognize um, from the, you know, typical of the style. And so Aerobac IT is really popular in the 1700s and not really as practical seating, but, but it was more about like foyer decoration. And the goal was really to like welcome people and display the wealth of, you know, the owners of the piece. So the paintings on this piece really depict that dual role, right? Like the golden hands are scattered throughout both sort of offering and withholding symbols of prosperity and hospitality. So I really like to use like practice traditional furniture, but use it to talk about contemporary things. So the same deal with this clock. You know, it's a classic Eli Terry shelf clock, um, but you can see that I sort of replaced um, the, this bottom panel with this hand enameled glass that sort of replaces, you know, it basically makes it seem like this little cabinet is almost like a little female body and the clock face is her face and sort of starts to create this tension displaying a little person as both subject and object. And so same thing, another one of these cabinets that I'm really playing with this glass enameling process um, and sort of messing with this blend of um, furniture as figure sculpture. And you can see in this little, um, these images here sort of playing on the classical sort of early American Samuel McIntyre carvings that typically feature cloth hanging in those catenary curves. Um, but the intent is again to combine those iconic decorative motifs with the functional cabinet, sort of exploring gender and power and domesticity. Uh, here's some of those little freaks. <laughs> so I started to have a lot of fun during COVID because um, I couldn't go to my you know large scale studio, but I still had little scraps of wood everywhere. Um, and I had just bought a bunch of these Tampico fibers and I started to, to just play around with brush forms. Um, and they became incredibly fun, primarily because they're just, they're an amazing way to test out techniques, you know, and practice carving and play again with that sort of, that line between functional and non-functional. So yeah, <laughs> there's quite a few of these um, real weirdos. I'm, I know they're not everyone's cup of tea, but I honestly love them. Um, and then just a little bit about sort of my, the rest of my practice, I'm an, I'm an active teacher. So I travel and teach constantly. Um, this one is um, at a workshop of our own, which is a woodshop for women and non-binary people. And I, I travel all over to teach, but um, I've sort of launched this project in the last two years um, with the help of the Minick Fellowship called the Chairmakers Toolbox. And the goal is really to provide free tools and education for underrepresented woodworkers. Um, and there's these three parts. And the first one is education. So we teach all these free classes. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, but Windsor chairs are perfect for beginners because you don't need a full shop. You don't need milling equipment. You don't even need electricity, really. Um, and I've been able to sort of network with all of these incredible teachers to offer these free classes. Um, and we just booked another one at Lost Art Press. So that one's going to be happening in July. And there's one actually right before that with Peter Galbert. So it's just like a huge fun community effort. So definitely check it out. Um, I designed this specific chair um, with the goal of making like the simplest possible chair for beginners to learn about um, with the idea being that then, you know, if the chair is simple enough then people get to learn how to design during the class, which is fantastic um, and part of, part of my goal. So the second part, which is I think maybe more up y'all's alley is the toolbox. So, Basically, if anyone's ever had to buy Windsor tools before you've seen, right, there's huge waiting lists for these things. These are like these weirdo little tools, but you're not able to find them anywhere. And so what I did was I partnered with all of these established metal workers who didn't know anything about woodworking, but were great tool makers, and then had them each choose a Windsor chair tool. And then they spent a year partnered with a master Windsor chair maker trading their tool back and forth in prototyping until they got really, really good. So here's um, David Clemens, who's a really incredible um, jewelry maker working with Caleb James on a spoke shave. 
and Peter Galbert here is um, explaining draw knives to these two really wonderful metalsmiths, Megan Martin and Andrew Mears. And then, yeah, they went through this sweet prototyping process and then came up with these just itching tools. <laughs> so here's some examples of them. Um, yeah, we've got almost a full suite, but not quite. And so I'm working with a few other people in order to, you know, just keep building that set of tools. So now those are on the market and they're purchasable. And we have all of these, like, you know, just an influx of new super high quality tools. Uh, the last one is the Living Tools Project, which is um, basically it gives retiring woodworkers an opportunity to donate their tools to a scholarship fund that awards them to then early in career furniture makers. Um, and there's only one rule, which is that donated tools can't be sold, but when they're no longer needed, they are given freely and then they remain gifts across generations, sort of amplifying the donor's original act of generosity and perpetuating change in the field. These are the uh, photos from our first major collection at a luthier studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, yeah, this example is, it, this collection is, you know, great example is given freely by the family and valued at over $10,000 and it will just have a life-changing impact on the eventual recipient. Um, this is actually me playing with the tools that I received. So right, right when I was about to launch into my career of Windsor chair making, um, a, a man donated his entire collection of Windsor tools to me. And I opened them. There's actually a photo somewhere. I should dig it out. But just of me like ugly crying all over a box of Windsor chair tools. Um, and just the, the impact of that donation was really what spurred this entire project. So anyway, just excited to be sharing that stuff with you. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. There's me after being bad at turning. Supposedly, if you're good at turning, you don't get shavings all over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm clearly I'm not good yet. So anyway, that's a little introduction to my work. Um, and then here's what we're gonna be working on. We're just I'm gonna show you basically this five seven rule, which is essentially the backbone of cabrio leg shaping and a lot of sort of complex shaping that you see in um, chair arms, legs, anything that has like both that has like a round over that's tapering. So something that is like you're removing very different amounts of wood throughout the entire process. And the cool thing is that these things were not done by like sculptors. These things were made by, um, by artisans, you know? So there's basically just a system of lines and then you follow them. So here's just a couple, like I make one sample leg to make sure I get my proportions right. And then you essentially break down the form into like face and edge profiles and then cut those out on the bandsaw. So those are those center pieces. And then you can see it's really rough. Other than that turned foot, it's just, you know, a little bit cut off. Then we do this thing called shape two lines and I'll show you how to do all of this. So those are the shape two lines. That's the part of the wood that's gonna stay. And then everything else is like this system that gets broken down and removed. There's the shape two lines going all the way down to the feet. Um, and there they are from another angle. So then you do this thing where you then break down the shape two line and you create this other line that runs and this is what this is what five seven means and we'll talk about it but it's basically seven sections on one side and five on the other and we remove the seven section side so you can see there I've done that I've removed that little section and so what you see is that what we're doing is removing like a ratio of wood so it's much less wood down here where the ankle is than it is up here by the knee all of this will make more sense, I swear. <laughs> and then essentially it's just repeating the same process of like ratioed wood removal until you end up with something smooth and elegant. It's very cool. So with that all being said, hi, I'm back. <laughs> Was there already a question? I feel like I saw something pop up in the chat. Is King gonna- more of a comment. Amazing, What's generous that? work. <laughs> oh, you guys, stop. All right, let's talk about the five seven rule. Okay, so while the cabrio leg um, is a lot more, um, it's a lot more dynamic expression of this particular tool, I think that learning it directly, like learning it for the first time in the context of the five seven, or in the context of the cabrio leg is not actually the most effective way to learn it. So I'm gonna show it to you in the context of a really simple round over. Um, 
so basically, let's say that the profile that I'm trying to get, instead of doing just a totally even profile, I'll do something that would at least be a really expensive router bit. How about that? Say so we want to remove that. And we want to remove it along the entire piece of wood. Now assume also that this piece of wood, let's say it extends 50 feet behind me. By the way, this is also this um, way that wood was, re was removed during mast making back in the day. So this is all like, it's a super old school technique, um, but it's, it's pretty gorgeous in its simplicity. So basically here's the deal. I want to remove this and I want it to go evenly all the way down as though I had used a router bit. So my shape two lines are these points where my profile hits the edge of my wood, meaning this line will be in my finished work. Everything else is gonna get removed. And now down here, this line is also gonna be in my finished work, okay? So those are my shape two lines, which means I'm gonna shape to them and not past them. All right, now we get into the five, seven action. All right, so between my shape two line and the edge of my wood, if I, in theory, separate this into 12 little sections, and I'm not gonna do that, you'll see why in a second. But if I did, if I split this into 12 little sections, what I would do is from the edge of the wood in, I would remove seven of them. And so the way that I honestly do this practically is I don't draw, 12 little lines. Instead, I just take what I call a fat half. So I can estimate half really easily. That's six sections. So I'm just going to move over a little bit further than that. And so I'm going to draw that line using my finger as a gauge. Finger gauges are very useful in this work. And then do the same over here. And unsurprisingly, because I'm removing less wood, my seven section is going to be smaller. Yeah. So it's still just a fat half. Now, if you're just doing this for the first time, it's not a bad idea to split it into 12 and just really see what, how fat your fat half needs to be. But because I've been doing it for so long at this point, I'm just, just gonna go for it. So between these two lines, I can remove all of my wood. And just to prove that point, if I connect them, see, I only just touch the outside of my profile. Does that make sense? All right, cool. No questions? I wish you guys were here so you could heckle me. No heckling? All right. So for this part, oftentimes I'll use a chisel. I mean, I'll just honestly just hammer it out. I don't know why I don't even have that one with me right now. Probably because my grain isn't super straight and I don't want to get into complicated work while you're all watching, but there we go. So one of the things I love about the five, seven rule and the reason why it works so well for max making and for cabriole legs is because you can remove so much wood so fast without thinking about it. You know, I'm not sculpting right now. I'm just working to my lines. You can see that's as kind as my grain is willing to be to me. And at this point, I pick up my little spoke shave and realize that it's obnoxiously close to my surface. There we go. All right. Questions so far about 5.7? Really nothing so far? Is this familiar to any other process that y'all have seen or learned in the past? No? It's just very logical. It is. The cool thing is when you get into a form like the cabrio leg, and maybe I should show you my screen again in a minute, once you've seen this in the context of this extremely simple application. But um, if you imagine that this, instead of being a blank of equal size throughout was tapering, 
then what I would do is I would choose my shape two line, which is the center of that cabriole leg edge. And then I would form my little five, seven breakdowns. And so I'd be moving a ton from the knee, very, very little from the ankle. And it would just start to form this incredibly sinuous and beautiful leg. And the best part is that all four match, right? Without, my, without me having to put all four next to each other. If I continue to follow these little ratios, no problem, right? All right, I have to flip this around so I can see it better. I wanted to make it so that you could always be seeing what I'm seeing, but such is not the life we live. All right. So you can see here that I've removed pretty much, if I were, if this were, if this were a fancy application, what I would do is I would go and split that line. Right now I'm just working to it and I'm gonna call that good enough because this is just for an example. But here's where we get into the next step. So now I have a new shape two line. So now I can see that my profile is now touching the center of this chamfer I've created. So now I have a new shape two line and I'm gonna draw it all the way down. And now I repeat my five, seven process, but I isolate this corner and then this corner. So what I'm gonna do is now divide the area between this shape two line and this high point, this waist high point, so that I remove a fat half. And I'll do the same thing here. And the goal, there's so many lines, I want it to be really clear what you're looking at. The goal is to remove that section. Okay. And I'll do the same thing down here. So here's my waist wood sticking up right there. So I'm going to work away from that, taking away seven, leaving five. Same deal over here, taking away seven, leaving five. Now at North Bennett, there were a few people who were so careful. They, they had all these like different colored pencils for clarifying which areas were being removed. And I understand the instinct, but a really nice way around that is quite simply to just feel it. If you feel a high point, that area is gonna be removed. You spread out from there, removing sevens from that high point down. So as long as you can sort of wrap your head around that and just keep track, it's no big. And you see it so fast, especially as I get into these smaller sections. Yeah? And that ratio works out regardless of how tight the radius is or how varied it is. It's, mm -hmm. It still carries through. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. It's incredible. So um, has anyone ever seen a spar gauge? Does that ring a bell to anyone? Um, spar gauges are incredible. They basically create the five, seven rule um, without you having to draw it. So you can, you can make one and you can Google it, but it's basically a little piece of wood. And then you put, you put some pencils in it essentially. And then you basically, oh, someone's nodding. You get it. Yeah, David knows. So there's two pegs on either side and then there's two pencils on thirds inside it. So essentially you drop your, your yeah, you, <laughs> David got it. So you take your little piece of wood with the two pegs, put it down on your blank, tilt it until the pegs hit either side. And then those pencils are naturally scribing as you go. So those spar gauges were used for boat building and mast making, but it's essentially the five, seven rule. Except the only issue is that you can't break it down even further the way that I'm breaking it down here. At that point, you have to just do it by eye. But it works really easily. And if I am working with something that's super tapered or complex, then all I do is just make sure that I'm drawing that shape two line really carefully. It can undulate, it, can, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm able to break down five, seven between my shape two line and the edge of my waist wood, I'm good to go. 
You're gonna save so much money on router bits. You're welcome. Also, I hate using the router. I'm not gonna lie. And we were just talking about our shaper origins too. So I'm totally <laughs> like used a router all day today. All right. Other thing is I'm usually, um, when I'm working with the five seven roll, I'm usually working on quite a long piece of wood. So it's odd to work on this little guy, but it works. All right, I'm almost there. And I'm paying special attention to just the edge that you're gonna be able to see. Um, when you're working on something complicated like a cabriole, one of the most important things to do is continually measure to make sure that your chamfers are flat all the way across. Because if you have a bell-shaped chamfer or a curved chamfer, then your ratios get all messed up. So it's like each step is easy, but you have to be as diligent and as careful as you can with each step because every other step depends on it. So it's like any inaccuracy sort of compound over time. Um, all right, so you can see I'm getting really close to that profile and I just have a few of these little high points at, at, like left over. And at this point, I'm just gonna, I just feel those high points and I knock them off. I wouldn't redraw my lines. They'd be too small and crazy. So I just take a few passes at the tip of the high point. And then if you've ever made a Windsor chair, this will be very familiar to you. So you take a few passes to take that high point off and then you just tilt, take one cut, tilt and take another. And that way I've created a really even curve. And then I'll just do that to all my other high points. So find a high point, take a couple passes, tilt, take a light one, tilt, take a light one. Same thing. It's interesting, I can now see how deep the Sharpie goes. Awesome. And I did all of that without looking at this at all. So once I'd made my drawing, there was not, I didn't have to reference it a single time. And I still got pretty darn close. It's cool, right? <laughs> There's a few people acknowledging it. Yeah, George likes it. <laughs> cool. So basically, I hope you can see sort of the way that this already super useful, even if you're just making quarter rounds and you don't want to buy, what would this be? Like $160 white side bit. Um, or just from that slideshow, this is an example of one of these weird carved brushes that I made. And every single one of these curves, you know, I subconsciously use the five, seven rule every time I make one of these to make sure that everything is symmetrical and curving equally. Make fun. Yeah. Question: if, if you're doing, say, a cabriole leg where you end up with a square uh, mm -hmm. at the top of the leg, yeah, the aprons. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you cannot. You have no end of the leg mm -hmm. to draw mm -hmm. that profile on. So, mm -hmm. how do you gauge your lines in a scenario at the top end of that? Super good question. Okay, let me just jump into screen share really quick again because now that you've seen this. I think that um, it's going to make a lot more sense when you look at these. Let's let's go back in time. All right. So we have a blank <laughs> and we have a fancy little leg. All right. So the first thing that you do is you think about it as two faces. So you look at your front profile and your side profile. Now, for this particular piece, they're the same. So you can see that I just went to the bandsaw and I just cut. Yeah, and this is where that block exists up here. You can see that I'm starting to articulate it, but mostly just leaving it be, because honestly that block is kind of the best place to clamp. And that's where the joinery for the leg is gonna go. Like that's where the apron connects. Um, but you can see here, these are my shape two lines and they jump in from the point where Basically, I guess, how do I say this? Where the, where the block that the, that the mortises are in 
where that is going to go straight up. Do you see what I'm saying? The, trans the transition point from curve. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And if you want to look closely, like there's, that's what it ends up looking like when it's complete. Do, do, do. Yeah. So that's the connection. And then just to click through really quick, you can see how I put in that five, seven line right there. And then how I removed the wood. And so all this is, this is bands, two faces bandsawed or four faces bandsawed a little bit. And then just a tiny bit of five, seven removal. Um, and then all I did was hit those high points and then smooth it out. Boom, cabriolet. Very cool. I know, right? <laughs> it's actually really hard. Um, so Fine Woodworking said that they've been pitched this, um, this rule a couple times and that they've never been able to write an article or you know, accept an article on it because it's too theoretical. You know, like if there's not like a specific project that you can now make that's unlocked by the five seven rule, except that as far as I'm concerned, like all of wood shaping is dictated by the five seven rule for me at this point. Um, I use it for absolutely everything. It's completely intuitive. And with that in mind, I'll show you um, slightly more complicated application of it in the context of um, these bench brushes that I make. Um, so I actually designed this bench brush to teach the five, seven rule. And I think it gets into what can be a little bit more complicated, but also more powerful about the process. So the first thing you have to do is you have to break down the complicated form into two different approaches. So the face profile and the edge profile. So the first thing is pretty simple, right? Cut out the face profile, <laughs> nailed it. Um, now the edge profile is a little bit more complicated and what most people when they're sculpting try to do is they try to combine all of these things at once like they try to just holistically sculpt the entire thing right like what's the classic michelangelo quote just remove everything that's not an elephant yeah. it doesn't work like that <laughs> i've actually sculpted a little elephant and i use the five seven rule for it so you have to break it down the same way that you do when you're making a piece of furniture from your front view, your plan view, and your, and your side view, essentially. So first thing is face view, then there's edge view. So I made a little pattern and cut this edge profile. Now we can get into exactly how I did that, but I don't want to waste your time, but I do want to give you this one sweet little trick that I learned at North Bennett um, that really has helped me when it comes to forming that face profile. So I'm just going to show it to you really quick. Very helpful. Um, so as I am working to try to make two sides meet evenly. So what I'm going to need, I'll, I'll draw them symmetrically. I don't want to confuse you. And you're seeing some like slightly fancier finger gauge work here. Okay, so I'm trying to make this profile flat across the front. Now it's relatively easy because this is a small piece, but imagine that this was really wide. So it's hard to just start removing wood from the face and just hope that you're gonna symmetrically reach both edges. So what I was taught to do, I'm gonna move my computer so that you can see me a little better. Why do tools always end up exactly where I need them not to be, all right? <laughs> okay, so the first thing that I was taught to do is to create a chamfer down to that line on both sides. And what that does is it creates a light break so that I can then remove wood from the front. And when I reach the base of the chamfer by removing wood from the front on both sides, then I know I'm even and flat straight across. So at this point, you could use your super tiny little curved bottom spoke shave, or you could just pick up a rasp, whatever. It's all good. So you can see my goal is just to make a chamfer right now. And now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. You guys are seeing my whole studio here in San Diego. <laughs> All right, 
So now here's my two little chamfers. They're not gonna be part of my finished brush. They're just how I'm establishing my side to side, my edge profile. So now what I can do is I can remove this wood in between and work down until the chamfer is gone. When that chamfer is gone, then I know I've created a perfectly even profile across the face. Show you what I mean. Maybe before I remove too much of it, I'll show you what it looks like closer up. Okay, so see how I have worked my little chamfer down to my line? And I've worked my little chamfer down to my line. So the genius of doing this is that when I'm working across the face, it's very hard to see both lines. I don't wanna be constantly like having to check and see if I'm going too far on one side or the other. So if I have my little chamfers, then I can just feel if I've gone too far and I can see if I've gone too far without having to look at a line. So it's cool. This is just like rough removal on a pretty dainty little thing. All right, so now without having to look at either of my black Sharpie lines, I know I've reached it because my chamfers are gone. I know I've created that profile evenly across. Make sense? So now if I were to do it on this side, I would chamfer down again to that little black line and chamfer down to that black line and then remove the wood across the face. Make sense? Make sense? Cool. Okay, the best part is like, again, imagine this thing is like eight to 10 inches wide. Now you have to do it this way because you're gonna start working one side and you're gonna make something that's basically just like a super long, awkward straight line that's not perfectly in alignment. So the goal is always just to make it as easy as possible to see what you're doing. Anyway, that works a treat, love it. All right. Hey again. All right, so on this one, I sped up and just did both sides um, real quick. So the next step is creating shape two lines. So I'm gonna start turning this giant awkward knob into a beautiful little round. So the way that I'm gonna do that and still sort of maintain this overall shape, like from the front, it's gonna still look this way, yeah? The way I'm gonna do that is shape two lines. So I have a shape two line that goes all the way around because I wanna maintain this profile. And it's gonna be, this is really gonna to start to show you the way that, it's basically the way that you couldn't even, even if you were willing to spend a bunch of money on router bits, it just wouldn't work. So that's my shape two line going all the way around. And now I need a shape two line on the front too. So in this particular brush, it has these nice chamfers on either side. So what I do is I find the little center of the neck. Normally I don't use a Sharpie for this. This is walnut and I just, I would hate if you were looking at a pencil line on walnut right now. Um, but I make a little shape two line all the way around the front. Same thing on the other side. And then just for kicks, that's what my chamfers will look like when the time comes. Okay, so now I've shaped two lines everywhere and now I need five, seven lines. Almost done. It's so cool because we're so far away right now, but we're actually secretly so close. All right, so here's my waist edge. So I'm gonna make my little five, seven removal line. 
And because it's a more complicated line, I like to make tick marks and then connect them. So I'll like separate, I'll split up five, seven in one spot and then in another spot and then in another spot and then evenly connect them all. It's easier for me that way. You can see just how little wood we're gonna be taking out of that neck area. I spoke to um, some of my friends who make violins. Oops, earbud down. I spoke to some of my friends who make violins and they were like, oh yeah, of course we use that rule. I was like, man, it's like this secret of full-time woodworking that I think all the publications are basically just like, oh, it's too boring to share, but it's so good. <laughs> Thanks for being interested. All right. So we're almost there. Pretty sloppy five, seven line on the front there. Forgive me. Okay. All right. So I have my shape two lines. I have my five, seven lines. I'm going to be removing that material. Yeah. Okay. Because there's so little of it, it's really easy to do with the rasp um, or the scotia. Maybe I'll just do a little scotia. I started making these just to warm up in the morning. It's really fun because there's some really fun brain direction stuff. There's just enough like hand and eye work to keep me interested. I was gonna guess that was like a Nicholson number 50, but it looks longer, it looks bigger. Yeah, I think it's just because I'm tiny. It is a Nicholson number 50. <laughs> okay. I actually get that a lot in my, um, Zoom demonstrations and I just did a presentation for Colonial Williamsburg and people are like, wow, your tools are so huge. And I'm like, no. <laughs> it's a great rasp. It's my favorite one by far. Sorry about these horrible noise. I'm gonna mute it for a second. It's just terrible. Okay, so now we have this little chamfered thing. And now if we were following the rules like good kids, what we would do is we would create a new shape two line right in the center of that chamfer and then create more lines. But I think that that would be a little bit overkill for the scale of this thing. So I'm just gonna demonstrate what it feels like and what it looks like to instead just remove high points. And again, we're very close to that full round without having to be a sculptor. I'm not sculpting at any point. The like highest level visual skill that I've used is splitting things in half, right? <laughs> and then working to that line. All right, I'm gonna mute it again because it'll be terrible, terrible sounding.
Okay. And it's, it's rounded over. So the last steps are basically just smart use of like hand tools. So now I have all these hideous rasp marks. The next move is filing and then card scraping. And then ideally you should just be hitting it with like the lightest possible 220 grit and then French polishing and you're done. So, I mean, part of the beauty of it too is that you end up with this incredibly gorgeous curved surface with tons of end grain, tons of like, you know, grain direction shifts and you're not sanding anything, barely sanding at all. So um, yeah, card scraper, file, and I'd be ready to French polish. So I think one of the other things I really loved about learning this was that it was just the perfect visual description of when to pick up the next tool. So I know exactly what sort of like what rasp mark can be removed really quickly with a file, which file mark can be removed really quickly with a card scraper, blah, blah, blah. I probably could skip to card scraper on this actually. I'm thinking just because my rasp marks were pretty gentle. Yep. You can see just right there, that's just rasped a card scraper. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool, you guys? <laughs> it's like a whole bunch of silence, but it's nice. Yeah. Um, unbelievably cool. cool. Yeah. We, we all love it. We all love it. So, Great. yeah, I mean, just touching that with the card scraper and then, yeah, I mean, dude, I mean, what else do you need? Just the lightest touch with my 220 grit and I'm French polishing. Like a, like a person who's not wasting time. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's the best. Oh yeah, you can definitely adopt me. Yeah, I'll take it. Let's do it. Um, yeah, um, questions. Like there was that great question about how to how to basically like in, get transition from a curved surface into a straight one. I don't know if you have any others that we can go over. Also just FYI, um, I did some dorky drawings that I think are pretty clear in a little handout that was um, attached to the email. Yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely feel free to use that. Um, I also have a little handout on how to use hand tools in the five, seven rule to make this specific brush which I'd be happy to share with you guys if you want that, just because, you know, you saw me do it. So it's kind of helpful to just have another way to visualize it. Cool, I'll email that to you guys too. I'll send that over to King and King can get it to you. I have a feeling he's the guy who can get it to you. What it, it sort of seems like something uh, in a small dimension like that handle, um, um, you could, you, you don't have to be so specific necessarily to be five, seven, but at six, six, you kind of you can fudge in there. It's it, it seems like five seven probably is more significant uh, in in a wider broader um, surface area or one where you transition like a like a cabriole leg where you narrow down. Is that mm -hmm. too general yeah. a statement? Or? So is my internet okay? You froze it up. Is? You froze there for a minute. But yeah. okay, let me know if I freeze up again. So the only, the only issue, so I tested that actually, I tried the six, six, just to see what would happen. And what ha happens is even though there's a rounded feeling to the piece, like there's soft edges, you can, you can sense the original block of wood in there. Hmm. You really can. Yeah. Um, and if you look at like, Basically, if, if you do sort of one of these super basic roundovers, like the one that I started with, and you try 6-6, six, six, what you'll end up with is you can see and feel those, those little, it's, it's funny. It really is funny. Um, uh, just, and also to give credit where credit is due, um, Will Neptune, um, if you know of him, he's the one who came up with this or sort of discovered this process. Um, and I think he sort of worked backwards from the spar gauge. Um, and then observed quite a few things in just quite a few legs. And there's a few Cabrio legs in the Yale furniture study that still, that were clearly made with a six, six mentality. 
and you can just you can feel like they don't have that impossible sinuous quality they have like a square blocky oh. and, and your fingers are your fingers can can feel mm -hmm. smaller variation than your eyes can see by a absolutely time. yeah yeah so it's true touch is definitely the way to go then mm -hmm. and you know i mean it really it's a subtle thing but um i think the fat half is a really good visual description of it you know it's just a little more than half we'll do it and typically people stop a little shy and they then you can just go a little further just round it out just work it down a little bit further and then eventually you get to the point where you really trust the five seven ratio and then it's it's much easier ah! this earbud doesn't want to stay in okay yeah that was a great question though yeah Anything else? There's some stuff in the chat. I might have missed some things. There's a lot of chitter chatter. <laughs> mm. hey, I have a question though yeah. for you, Aspen. Mm -hmm. Going back a, a bit to your presentation. So yeah. the like the, the black settee you did with the gold imagery. Yeah. And the glass work as well. Do you do that uh -huh. artwork as well? Or do you, yeah. do you work with some? Get out. Are you serious? Yes. Serious. Yeah. I love working, painting and working did a did a, a video on that uh yeah. aspen where you showed how you did that it was absolutely amazing oh i'm so glad that you liked it it's a yeah, fine woodworking were, video or what it was like a webinar but oh. i think you can see it still i think it's still up there somewhere they said that it was time-based but then barry said he would just leave it up for you guys <laughs> people were asking about it which is very flattering um yeah i just sort of made up that that process of getting that Hitchcock imagery, but without having to build a stencil. Yeah. How, how did you do that? What, what is it painted on? I, I mean, I don't have a clue. Yeah, um, actually, so if you, the fine woodworking webinar, I even went over how I made the gold, but it's basically like a gold powder mixed with oil. And then I airbrushed it using like, so I basically like covered the piece with tape like a thin, like delicate painter's tape, drew imagery directly onto the tape, used an X-Acto knife to cut all of it out that did not peel anything off, and then would peel off sections at a time and airbrush around. And for that settee, I didn't actually have an airbrush yet. So I was using, it's called an atomizer. It's like a little cup filled with oil, and then it has like a straw across it. And so it's like blowing on it. <laughs> um, shit. Yeah, I pulled so out my friend, Greg's house and he was just watching laughing at me like I just was being yeah he, well so yeah so you're, you're building up you're building up the colors or or, or shading the areas mm -hmm. sort of like woodblock carving woodblock printing mm -hmm. so you start totally and work your way back yeah out, I think. yeah and I'm just my chemicals get here tomorrow but my plan for the rest of this residency which is three months and don't tell anybody. I, I like mentioned it a little bit during my um, Colonial Williamsburg talk, but I haven't really told the world, but basically I've learned how to mirror glass. So like pour mirroring chemicals. Um, and so you can pour glass that's like, you can pour mirrors that are silver-based, gold-based, galena, which is like a dark gray. Um, and then the goal is essentially to use those similar masking techniques and airbrushing to like make images using Mirror, mirror chemicals oh. like in a yeah so the whole thing will be a mirror but there'll be like imagery inside it fingers crossed that it works i have no idea if it will and but you just got to try i guess you don't have to do it in reverse or you do or do you <laughs> you oh, do man. yeah but i mean i did that with the so the um clock and the cabinet with the glass those are both reverse painted with glass enamels yeah Life's fun, man. There's so many things. Um, before I was a woodworker, it was all drawing and painting. And I started woodworking. I'm, it's my five year anniversary tomorrow. Five year, what? My, I started woodworking at five years ago at North Bennett. They taught me then. So it's my five year anniversary tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> You're trying to make us feel bad, aren't you? You've no. done pretty good for five years. <laughs> I I've had a my... very lucky, my training has been amazing. If you're ever at on the west or on the east coast, definitely check out North Bennett. But 
I'm about to go to Krenov, get to see Krenov School. I don't know if anyone has, has been over there, heard great things. Yeah, Laura Mays' work is incredible, huge what, fan. What are you gonna do there? To study Just giving or? a lecture. No, okay. I'm giving, I mean, I would love to learn there, but I also feel ridiculous, like going to school again. <laughs> Um, but school's great, so yeah, it'd be awesome. So I'm, I'm me teaching a little bit over there, but yeah. yeah. Amber, Amber, where 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 did you train? You said the Bennett School? the North Bennett Street School. Where Have is you that? Heard of it? It's no. in Boston. Oh, Boston. Okay. Yeah, it's actually the oldest. I believe it's the oldest craft school in the country. Um, okay. And they have a bunch of weird programs. So there's um, fine furniture, which is what I did. There's also a three-year violin making program. Um, there's a two-year preservation carpentry program, um, piano technology, there's jewelry making, book binding, um, and everything is just like ultra traditional. Mm. It's very fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely check it out. They also have um, continuing ed courses online there. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm actually about to start teaching for them um, in their online like continuing ed classes. So there's some great stuff. I mean. Yeah, a lot of my instructors teach there. We teach online. So check it out. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Very um, cool. Oh, shoot. It's already eight. You guys. Uh oh, you're freezing up. Oh, uh, of course. Oh, there. Good. Did I freeze up? Yeah, you froze up on us. Were you nervous? Oh no, I'm sorry. Clearly. <laughs> there you go. Um, what was your question? What was your question? So sorry. It's okay. Did somebody have a question? I have a comment. Uh, Aspen, I, I was a teacher for a long time and you are an exciting teacher. And I could listen to you talk about cleaning trash cans. <laughs> you, you just, you have so much energy and, uh, and you make it look so easy. You know, a five-year or a two-year course, I'm not going to live that long, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to have to stand in awe of you, you know. That's, <laughs> that's very sweet. I was a high school teacher for five years, actually, before I became a woodworker. So. Well, you can't be more than 25. 35, you guys. <laughs> Holy smokes. I've got wow. socks on that are older than that. <laughs> well, wait till you get to this, you know. <laughs> I'm ready. It's going to be great. <laughs> the cool thing about woodworking is you can do it forever. So. So Aspen, I've got to ask though, because you, you blow me away with your, your talent. So you've been woodworking for five years, but you've got all these, con you know, your your website and your bio, you've done work for everybody, all the, he the heaviest things. How, what'd you do? Just decide, okay, I'm going to be a woodworker and then I'll be associated with all the heaviest <laughs> people anywhere. <laughs> and that's just what it's going to be. It's been a wild ride. I still wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, is this real? Did this happen? Um, yeah, it's super, it's crazy. I mean, I don't know how I got as lucky as I did with my mentors and instructors. I know Pete Galbert, he's my probably, he's one of my best friends at this point in my life. And he, he really like, he just chose me in a way you know it's like I was yeah. working on uh on a cabinet and doing a carving and he just walked past and I didn't know who he was and he was like do you want to get a taco and I was like no I don't know you <laughs> <laughs> and um <laughs> like some weird guy asked me to get a taco and then someone at the bench next to me was like Aspen that's Peter Galbert and like he's actually really great and you should probably go get a taco with him and so I went and we get and you know gosh how do I, how do I say I'm the luckiest kid in so many words, you know? And I think like, I really believe in the community of woodworking and I try to give back as much as I can. I mean, that's what this like chairmaker's toolbox project is about. 
You know, I spent so much time teaching for free. Like those classes cost nothing, you know, and the goal is just to get more, get more people like putting their hands on wood for the first time. And then like me, I had a six year plan to buy those Windsor chair tools. And then they just arrived in the mail. It changed my entire life, you know? And so like, I know so many people for whom like a hand plane, a couple of rasps and a spoke shave changes their life. And so, yeah, like I'll collect tools and like honor the careers of people who have gathered those tools and then support new makers at the same time. I mean, I don't see the downside personally. <laughs> it's great. So yeah, I mean, just being like absolute, I'm just jazzed all the time. Like I am just an excited person. <laughs> Your energy and positive attitude will continue to open doors for you, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, I'm very shy it. though. Thank you for having me. It doesn't seem I'm... like it. <laughs> One last well, thing. One yeah. last thing. Were you at least teaching art when you were teaching high school? or were I was. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. So you've been an artist your whole life. I've been into art my whole life. When okay. I, I went to college in, in Portland, Oregon, and my degree is actually in Russian literature, but really? I do like... <laughs> I, art has always been, yeah. Art's always been the thing I really loved. I just didn't know it was allowed. <laughs> I didn't know you were allowed to be like an adult who did this, you know? And especially woodworking, you're definitely not. I mean, there's still some days where I'm like, is this allowed? It's yeah. too fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Ashley, supposed to be harder. What's up? We do have a question on the chat here from Richard Gillingham. Do you offer Zoom-based hands-on training on your 5-7 method? You know, I have actually a number of times. Um, now that classes are in person again, I've been doing it less. You know, I've been doing online classes less because I'll be in person. Like I'm actually teaching and there's still a couple spots left. My chair class at Fort Townsend is sold out and it has been for a while. People are just hungry for chairs, they love chairs. But um, the brush making class that I'm teaching at Port Townsend, I think still has two spots in it. And that's in, May, I forget which week of May, it's a, one of the second, like in the second half of May. And it's all just these sculptural approaches, like we'll be building a cabriole leg, we'll be shaping, it's all shaping by hand and like learning how to use your eye and read grain and use hand tools and like the appropriate order so that it's just a simple and easy flow and you never plug anything in. So yeah, like I think that that is sort of, that's that's the approach that I've been taking. I'll be teaching at Lee Nielsen when they open up again, doing um, hand tool stuff, but that's in Maine, that's far. Port Townsend, I think is the closest I'll, I'll get. And there is that class and normally this stuff sells out really fast. So that one still has two spots. I haven't advertised it on my Instagram yet. I think if I do, they, it probably will sell out. But if you're free and if you're interested, it'd be super cool to meet you and do five, seven for five days. Oh, cool. You'll get very good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. There was another question uh, yeah. on the chat. Uh, do you ever use a hand plane in your rounding over? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Um, if I, let me see. I actually often use this little guy. It's a little Wee Nielsen rabbiting plane. I really like it because I can shift the blade a little bit and get all the way into the edges. So I, I, I like that. Honestly though, like flat bottom spoke shaves. So not either of the ones that I was using, but like your standard flat bottom Lee Nielsen buddy. This is really great. I use this constantly when I'm um, doing like an actual cabriole leg that has a wider area. A hand plane is just a bit annoying to hold. And as you can see, this process is really quick. So like the, the time, I guess this, the timeline in which I would be using the hand plane is pretty short. Um, I do use it when I'm making Windsor chairs though. So when I'm making spindles and I'm like octagonalizing and then rounding, I will use a hand plane at times for sure. I know Chris uses, for Schwartz uses um, hand planes exclusively. I'm more into the shave horse. So I like this book shave. But yeah, totally. Little guy is easier. Something you can hold in one hand. Any other questions? 
You are inspiring. I've run way <laughs> over. I'm so sorry. We're I'm not. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're not. Uh, well, I really, I really hope that was clear, and I will send you the handout too. Um, it's all just hand drawn, so just that's cool. Opinion. This because this one was great. So if you've got, yeah, yeah, it's just an, it's another one like that. Yeah, I've been like ramping it up. I started making. I made a zine for the chair that I designed. So if you like take the class, you get like this ridiculous <laughs> hand drawn like booklet on how to make it because I can't stop can't stop moving um is there there is another question you got into you got into oh yeah i make all my spindles by hand yeah definitely so i split everything from a log um and i make yeah you make it all by all by hand it wouldn't be strong enough if you didn't and i make mini chairs too if i'm gonna like if i'm i'm playing with the jenny alexander chair so i just made these yesterday just to see <laughs> if it works and these are yeah so it's this is basically a spindle that's as small as my as my spindles for that big green curved settee got. and they're all yeah they're all spoke shaved first you know split with the split with the fro and then worked with the draw knife and then brought to size and um to their finished surface with the spoke shape occasionally with a scraper but that makes the milk paint weird so usually not this milk paint adheres differently to a scraped surface than a cut surface. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. We've, oh. we've got a lot more years making mistakes than you have. Oh my God, I make mistakes 24 hours a day. It's like my full-time <laughs> job. It's totally fine. <laughs> um, hey, it's a super pleasure to meet you all. If you want to come to come to Fort Townsend when I'm there, I'll be there for two solid weeks. I won't know what to do or where to go or what. Can I buy else you a taco? That's yeah, in me, buy me right? a taco. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to have a lot of strange looking guys coming up buying your taco. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm here you. to buy that taco. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I can eat tacos all day. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> Okay, if you, awesome. show up to, if you show up to buy her a taco, at least wear your uh, NWCA hat so yeah. she'll know. There it is, totally. Uh, <laughs> or think... just suggest a taco. I think that's enough of like, a, that's our secret. I don't tell that story about Pete very often because it makes him sound creepy and he's not. <laughs> um, I think yeah. we need to send her an NCWA hat. Oh yeah, do it. This one's that getting one, uh, that one pretty looks like ragged. Seen a little better, a little better yeah. days there. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I get attached to my little grubby items. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I would totally, I'd totally wear some swag. So, um, <laughs> awesome. Well, oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So thank nice you so to. Much. Oh my God! Yeah, That's my great. pleasure, my total pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Great presentation. Appreciate it. Oh, of course. Literally any time. And reach out if you want on Instagram or through my website. I would love to hear from you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.